Good morning, good evening, or good afternoon, wherever and whenever you are listening or watching today's podcast. I am Adam Parry, editor at Event Industry News. And today I have a very special guest and a long, long time event industry friend, Jason Allen Scott, here with me today to talk about the power of podcasting in a pandemic. I don't know if I've just coined that phrase, maybe, I, I don't know. Um, but Jason is a podcast host, tutor, teacher, speaker, the, what doesn't he do? But uh, Jason, so explain to people listening better than I can what you what you do for our sector in the industry. Thank you very much. Well, I was uh, an industry person like yourself. I organized events. I did events nonstop for over a decade. I unfortunately found out that after going blind for four days that I had a uh, autoimmune disease, multiple sclerosis. I decided to go into the event tech world, like completely in your space. I tried to start the LinkedIn for venues for events called Venue Me. And I launched a podcast to tell the tale of swapping roles in the hope that it would inspire, it would be a great story. I could, you know, play it for my kids. It would be easier than trying to film everything sort of Casey Neistat vlog style. Uh, and then the podcast took off. It did incredibly well. Sadly, spoiler alert, my tech business collapsed, burnt. Um, but my podcast did really well. And uh, so well, in fact, that I was invited to number 10 Downing Street to talk about the power of podcasting, storytelling. I won top 100 small businesses at the time. I found multiple ways to monetize. And then I, I created a formula. And anyone who's in science knows a formula only works if it's repeatable, no matter who is doing the experiment. So I started a second show, which was called Not Another Crypto. That did very well within the crypto and blockchain space. I sold it to be a, a co-owner of a tech business. I started another one, this time in the event space, completely with nothing else. It was called Smart Event Planning. It's, it's got 127,000 listeners, 21,000 on our newsletter subscriber base. And same thing, just followed a formula and then realized I could teach this to other people so that they could use the power of podcasting to link to their audience, to create great content, perennial content, that they could you know, spread the message of what they were doing. They could promote their shows. And that's what I've been doing. I've been running a course and a masterclass where we kind of have real accountability and take them from zero to online podcasting hero. Okay, so let's rewind because there's a lot there and I'd love to dissect this up. Um, there's, some, there's some amazing tidbits in there already, but let's go back to you launching your, your tech business, right? Um, you're a speaker, you're a paid speaker, people pay you good money to mm. engage their audience. Was that, was that the reason you launched a podcast? Was that a, a, a fair transition in leveraging podcasting and, and that kind of um, content opportunity as a speaker? Did you see that, that, that move quite over quite easily? Absolutely. It was, it, I knew it would be my first monetization strategy is that they would immediately hear me speak. They'd notice I don't do any ands, buts, likes, ums, ahs. And they'd go, oh, he's a good speaker. They knew that I could propose concepts and I could um, translate various tech talks, et cetera, et cetera. All these things were just giving me a great showreel for my speaking opportunities. And if someone said to me, oh, Jason, I'm thinking about hiring you for a talk on um, health and well-being, I could say, great, actually, I did an episode of that, season two, episode five. You can hear me give a speech about that. And they, there it was. There was no need. They didn't have to go look for it. I didn't have to go back to the office. I didn't have to call my VA and say, send a link. I could just pick up your phone, go to iTunes, go to Spotify, and there I am. And there's the talk. And it's canned. It's done. You know, I've, granted, I try and do a talk different every single time I do it, but they could hear sure. the entire speech and idea. So it became the very first way I monetized the podcast was by selling talks. Uh, which I still do to this day. I now do audio books um, all the time. Much I do an audio book every three months and it's the exact same podcasts, cutting them up and making them into books. Number two of the monetization strategies of a podcast. Okay, so does three bring us on to how you got involved with the Not Another Crypto podcast then? Was that somebody else seeing you as a podcast host, as a speaker and going, this guy can help me with my podcast and leverage my audience and engage my audience. Is that how that, that kind of worked out? 100%, that's exactly how it worked. They heard me on another show. They were looking at how do they connect product to an engaged audience. The beauty of podcasting, and this is something which is very different to a virtual event, is that you are creating a fan base that keeps coming back. It's, it's a mm -hmm. subscriber. You know, I don't miss an episode of 
um, Joe Exotic on Tiger King because I subscribe to that show. Immediately, I am now in, right? I'm in the mix. I'm a fan. I, I do something active versus passive. Unlike virtual events where it's kind of the old school of television where I have to be at a place at a certain time to be a part of something. I don't know. I get to it when I get to it. Um, and he, could, he really understood that. And he had this tech platform and he thought, what a great way, one, for me to get my word out there, two, to create an engaged audience of people that subscribe, that get information every single day. Three, unlike any other medium, I don't have to go hashtag sponsored content. I don't have to say paid commercial. I can just say this is the greatest tech product in crypto in the world and not worry about litigation. Then I can leverage expertise by getting other experts on the show. It suddenly is cool by association. Well, they use the, the platform Pink. They like the investment tech that provided. So that becomes cool. Also client acquisition, which is another mm -hmm. one, right? You can't get someone on a phone. You can't get through the gatekeeper. Well, get them on your podcast to talk yeah. narcissistically about their own product. And suddenly you've got an opportunity to sell them yours. Yeah. And, and, and I think what we found from our podcast as well is, let's take the Pink podcast. Maybe they want to get in front of somebody. They, they want that one-on-one -on -one time. They might not be able to get a meeting with them, but, you know, hang a carrot out to their, to their own self-importance, maybe. Yeah. If that, that's yeah. probably a, a negative way of putting it. But, you know, if you look to them and say, listen, we would love for you to speak about what you do and how you do it to our audience, then by proxy, that gets you that one-on-one, -on -one, very personal and very in-depth meeting as well because you get the as the as the host you get all the opportunity to ask as many questions and whatever questions and as deep questions as you want yeah. so you can actually steer it how, how you want as well so i think that's a really interesting strategy as somebody who might be looking to launch a podcast for their business for their supplier as an organizer that that gives them the the free will to and the the right to to invite those people in that may not might be able to get meetings with and um actually quiz them however they want. It's, it's a really interesting dynamic. And it's, it's both sided. I think that's something else people forget. Not only can you get your heroes on your show and, the pe and your potential clients, but you can get your competitors on your show and yeah. you can take apart what's wrong with their products while highlighting what's right with yours. So for sponsors of podcasts, and this is famous, Procter & Gamble during the Great Depression of 1923, they put all their money into this thing called radio broadcasting because it was an opportunity to push their products through what they then called soap operas, hence Procter & Gamble, soap, soap operas, these stories where they constantly mentioned their products and spoke badly about their competition. And you can do this in a podcast and it, it still works. It's absolutely brilliant. So that's where, uh, that's where Joey exactly went wrong. He, he should have had a podcast, <laughs> right? <laughs> he should have had a podcast. Because I'll tell you another thing, right? If you, if you actually, if anyone who is a total fan as I am of this whole concept of Joe Exotic goes and watches these episodes, it's the same problem you have at a virtual event. It's one person looking directly mm -hmm. into a steady yeah. cam, just filming. That's very difficult to be exciting, no matter how great the host is, how much flagellation of hand movement goes on. Yeah. There's a whole bunch of things that need to work. With a podcast, it doesn't. I can sound as good as Joe Rogan, who spends 50000 a season on his podcast, and I spend less than 500 bucks because all I need is a good producer to equalize my sound and a good pop filter and headphone and the microphone, and I'm good to go with Skype connection or a Zoom. Yeah. Whereas you need proper studio quality to make a great virtual event or webinar or video as, you know, as, as Casey Neistat has proved. And now everyone's trying to be Casey versus this sort yeah. of shot. And I think let's, let's dig into some of those comparisons because that's one of the reasons I wanted to get you on, onto this podcast today. Um, we clearly can see, um, we publish a lot of this news and a lot of information about suppliers who can help leverage virtual event technologies, live streaming, et cetera for those event organizers to, to reach an audience, um, which is great. And it's working. And those event organizers are already making money out of it. I'm connected with a number of that are. That's great to see. However, not all of the industry has the budget the event organizer has. Not all of the events industry has the relationships with the sponsors to make that dynamic work. And not all have an audience that is willing to pony up 250, 300 quid to sit through an event, you know, there's a whole supply chain that's there that, that doesn't have that ability necessarily. Um, but they are connected to, to great people, great minds, great prospects, et cetera. They, they have those relationships. They just don't necessarily have some of the other building blocks 
to create what I would call an engaging event. Anybody can run a webinar, right? Let, let's be honest about it. I can set a webinar tomorrow, bring you on, call it a, an, a virtual event. And it's, it's just, yeah, it's probably just more of a podcast than anybody really doing anything Absolutely. else. Or it's one of those really bland presentations, which is actually disguised, a demo disguised as a virtual event of my services kind of thing. Yeah. But virtual events, for me, actually podcasts can come out of them. I've started to see podcasts happen, sorry, podcasts happening at live events mm -hmm. as part of the content strategy. And I think for me, I don't know whether you agree with this, Jason, podcasts actually offer much more potential scope for audience engagement than a virtual event does in the sense that the discoverability of podcasts mm -hmm. is higher. Cool. Um, the networks in which those podcasts are distributed on and sit on have been built. They've been built on for years. People are yeah. used to using them as well. It's the access too. to get that into the attendee or, or your listener's phone device is, is much easier. And I would argue that the attention span of a podcast is a lot higher or a lot longer than a potential virtual event. And I'm just talking about my own experience here. You mentioned Joe Rogan a little bit earlier on. Mm. I, I will listen to a three-hour podcast with Joe Rogan on the right subject on a commute somewhere to a meeting or in the gym or break it up and stuff like that. I don't think I've ever sat through a three-hour presentation for anything ever in my yeah. life. Um, so that, that for me kind of suggests that podcasts are this, this untapped potential of the ways of communicating and engaging your audience on a particular subject, your particular niche, like the, like the crypto one that you guys yeah. did. Um, do you, how do you see it? Do you, do you agree? Do you see it slightly differently? 100%. Now, st again, statistically, if you have a video, and you know this, you're on YouTube, if you have a video that is longer than five minutes and someone watches for more than five minutes, you're on the top 80% percentile of engagement. Mm -hmm. More than five minutes, that's top 80. So that means what? That means that 80% of people have stopped watching after five minutes. The average podcast is 28 minutes long and has a 90% completion rate. Well, I don't know about you, but I know that every product service I've ever sold, every business I've ever consulted for, and every book I've ever read about great business says the only way that people buy from you is because they like, know, and trust you. Well, I've got a much better chance of knowing you, liking, and trusting you if I've spent over 20 minutes with you versus less than five minutes with you. So yes, 100%. There is something about long form content when it comes to podcasting. That I, I write huge articles, right? For LinkedIn, for Medium, for all the people. I write books. I don't get the engagement I get with a 15 minute podcast yeah. on, you know, it's just free, which anyone can get at any time. And there's something about, and then people binge listen. They like one and suddenly they subscribe. They listen to a second, a third, they go to your back catalog, much yeah. like they do with records and albums. And that is something else, which is incredibly special about this because it is the most native of mediums. It's storytelling. You know, it's one person speaking to another, whether like we are now in a sort of typical format of Q&A, whether I'm talking directly to my listener. That is something you almost, again, don't get from a webinar. And a lot of webinars and virtual events, they need multiple staff members. As you know, meeting rooms that need to be set up on the side, MCs hosting this big contingent for it to be done properly with a podcast you don't. Yeah. And I think there's an argument there for, for overall using a podcast for, for revenue generation and, and, and I'm segueing into your, your 22 ways to make a podcast pay is that, you know, when you take all that, that work that goes into delivering a virtual event, you take platform costs, you take distribution costs, staffing costs, marketing promotion costs, etc. If you're lucky enough, you have amazing content where you can charge tickets and that's, that's a fair excuse to do a virtual event with a revenue, as a revenue stream. But then you also got to sponsor it and, and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's a big play, right? It's, it's, not a, it's not a super easy play into we're just going to launch a virtual event. But actually for probably sub a thousand pounds, you can have a great mic, great camera, um, a, a subscription to Zoom like we're on now. And you can still engage your speakers with a great host like yourself. Maybe it, you. that's one of the biggest costs. Yeah. And go, right, Jason, I want you to interview on this particular theme of event um, or topic, um, these 15 speakers, as, it, mm -hmm. as you would like keynote style, Q&A on stage, that kind of stuff. Give them their own, their, their own part in that. And then sell that to a sponsor. So for, for a grand or a couple of grand and, and a speaker, um, a, a host fee like yourself, you might be able to still push out what essentially is a virtual content stream, a stage, mm -hmm. and make just as much money except with probably 10% 
of the work. Um, 100%. So let's, that, that's just my own opinion. Um, it's, it's true. It's factual. It's been, it's proven again. And again, we did it with season two of the guestless podcast. Uh, season two of Smart Driven Planning podcast is all about Berlin. And surprisingly, every single venue is in Berlin. Every uh, association we spoke to is in Berlin. Well, that's not an accident. That no. is an event we've put out as a podcast, which is Berlin specific. Yep, absolutely. And, and in the interest of transparency, event industry news, our podcast is a revenue stream. People put their brand against it to reach people that are listening to us, that are our readership. Um, and that works great for them in terms of, of, of scope, of coverage, of impressions and that kind of stuff. I so let's go use. I mean, that's another benefit. Like I've used a show that I know of yours before again and again and again. Someone said, oh, Jason, can you, you know, have you ever written a book or something? I said, oh, I, not only have I written one, but I did a great interview with Event Industry News. Let me send you the link. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, it's perennial and I can use it again and again. And I could take that RSS feed because, you know, it's just a feed. It's just a link back yeah. and stick it on my website. I can embed it into my LinkedIn posts. I can add to my, and you've done all the work but I get yeah. to reuse it again and again and again as a guest, as someone that's been on the show. Absolutely. So anybody, for anybody listening to this podcast now, who's probably at that point where they're like, I've got some interesting people that I could speak to. I'm confident enough to be able to set up a Zoom meeting and, and speak into a microphone, but they're contemplating like, can I make this pay? Can I, can I make money? Can I make revenue from me spending the, this time speaking to these interesting people? You mentioned and, and promote the fact that you have found 22 ways to make money from a podcast. Can you, yeah. can you divulge some of those and maybe tell us a little bit more about where people can find the full list of 22? Because I think, you know, 22 might take us probably a couple of hours to go through. But <laughs> what, what, what's, the, what's the top ones and where can people find the, the so, other stuff? Oh. Of course. So uh, a pod, www.apodcastmasterclass.com is where we teach it, the business of podcasting. Um, and we also have a hand-holding experience. You come on twice a week, Wednesday and Friday, 12 to 1, and we'll deal with you personally. We take small classes, only 12 people, and we pair them up. So there's, they're always accountable to the person plus me and my team. Mm -hmm. We also produce your first three shows, so we know that those first three are good. Now, that's one of the tricks networks only listen to your first episode so when you send your podcast into itunes spotify uh, etc spotify now being the biggest in the world they only listen to episode 000 which is tech talk is really episode one but it's a three to five episode which explains what's coming up in a show who's coming up what's going to be about and the platform listens to it because they want to see if it will bring an audience to their platform which is all they care about right so we teach that. And if you've got that, you've got your first monetization stream because you can take that episode to an assembler and say, hey, this is the show. It's going to be called Smarter Event Planning. My avatar, my perfect listener is a secretary or a personal assistant or an event who organizes events. And she's looking for tips, tips tools, tricks, technologies that can make her life easier, mm -hmm. working smarter and not harder. There, that's the whole concept. That's my episode one. Assembler says, oh, actually, that's the market for us yes but i said great who would you like to get in front of who can't you get into a meet and they said, oh that's interesting how does that work and i said well you will get on the show and then it's very easy for me to say oh and our co-host is david from assembler boom now i've got a second revenue stream not only is he yeah. my sponsor but he's my show then i might say to him you know david i'm also going to have 10 quick fire questions and what i'd like is for you to sponsor one of those questions so I use the uh, assembler form to organize all my events. Well, that's a sponsored question. I happen to use Canvas Planner when I'm organizing all my collaborative tools. That's yep. a sponsor. I don't have to say that, which again is a benefit. I don't have to go, the following question is sponsored by Canvas Planner. <laughs> no, so I've now got three ways to profit from my podcast. And I haven't even talked advertising yet or yep. listenership. I, I've, had a, um, I've had a video go viral on YouTube, hit a million. I thought, this is it, big money coming in. My check was 1,088 pounds. And that's because mm. it was predominantly America-based, which is where all the money in YouTube comes from. I've had 1,000 listeners from a podcast and made uh, 38,000 pounds. Because all I did is I took 1,000 people and I sold them my book, which was 12 pounds. And they yeah. all went out and bought the book. So that's my next revenue is have a product. It doesn't have to be a physical product. My first book was uh, an ebook. Just they paid nine nine nine. It was sent across to them, and there it was. And I could have done that on Scriber for free. And and just on that point, if you are uh, 
if you're a company listening to this and you're thinking, well, well, actually my intention is to do more lead generation, then that point still stands, right? Because you could oh. create content, downloadable content, gated content, which is connected to the topic and subject matter and helpful to that, that audience member and say, listen, we've, we've got this free guide, this free book here. Give us your name and email address and a, a, few, a few details. That is another way to monetize your revenue stream because then you can, you can uh, nurture in your marketing funnel that, that contact and, and right. hopefully make them into a, a, a paying customer later on the line, which may have a, you know, you might be a tech company with a hundred grand license fee out or something. So that, that one person is worth a hundred grand to you kind of thing. So that, yeah, the cost even of the client acquisition is too behind. Yeah, even if it's free, you can, you can still make that pay, right? And that's another thing. Like we, we don't give away 22 ways. That's, that's the secret sauce, right? That's our 11 herbs and spices. <laughs> um, but often I'll talk to people. I say you know, the three types of traffic, the traffic that you own, the traffic that you get, and the traffic that you pay for. Now, the traffic you paid for is advertising. We pay for an ad to be on Facebook or LinkedIn or Instagram or whatever it is. Well, that's great. But as long as those platforms exist, we're okay. But if they disappear, I've lost that, that traffic. It's gone yeah. forever. Then there's the second one, which is, you know, the one people speak about. So I'll finish this and I'll tell everyone about it. It's great, but you can't count on it. You can't count that I'm going to run out every single day to talk about you. And then there's the traffic you own, which is a subscriber, whether that subscriber on your podcast is great, but a subscriber who gives you their email, like you said, that's when you've got them in your funnel. And for me, that whole business, my business is find a traffic source that you can drive it to something where you can get their information, that you mm -hmm. can start that nurture campaign, that you can get them to know, like, and trust you. Because then whether I sell them a book, I've sold underwear, I sold men's spanks called spunks, just to test it, to see if my audience would buy it. They bought, I've sold events. I'll be at the following event. If you'd like to come see me, buy a ticket, we've sold that. So that's another monetary stream, right? You can drive a fan base and you only need a fan, true fans. Obviously a Greg Kelly famous blog post went viral, mentioned by Tim Ferriss, Russell Brand, et cetera, et cetera. But just yep. see the maths, a thousand people spending a thousand pounds over the space of a year on your event is a million quid in revenue. What other platform allows that? Yeah, absolutely. And I suppose that brings me on to individuals like yourself right now who are possibly looking at ways they can have an income stream because the face-to-face -face events, you know, I was speaking to a gentleman the other day, Brian Fanzo, our social fans, and I think within the space of 24 hours, he had six months worth of work postpone and disappear. That's, that's, a, that's a huge loss to a professional speaker's Absolutely. income for that year. He's been very forward thinking. He's taken himself out there. He had, I think the other week, 17 inquiries in his inbox for, for virtual event hosting. Um, but some people don't necessarily want to necessarily give their sessions away online, right? They, they, they prefer to have them um, there and then in the moment. And, and you can only hear that story and, and that session by, by physically being there and that presentation. They don't want their presentation to be online and people can just go to YouTube and, and see it, right? That's, yeah. that's their secret sauce. But podcasts for professional speakers like yourself, actually in a time now, present a huge amount of opportunity to, to create revenue stream, right? There's probably a lot of companies out there that don't have the time, don't have the people, don't have the, the want or the need to deliver their own podcast. They don't, they don't want to host it themselves. But actually, as a marketing spend, we'd be quite happily to bring somebody like yourself in, set the content, have somebody else deliver it as a freelancer. Oh. And, and what would you say that would be worth as an income stream to a, to a professional speaker on a retainer for, let's say, a podcast a month or something like that, Jason? You can make anything from uh, 550 up to 25,000 pounds in a month. Yeah. Through, through it. I mean, I just had a, a brand new podcaster. She's never done anything. She did our course. Um, English is her second language. She did her episode one. We told her to send it out that plus a media kit. We should teach put a media kit together. And she got a job at 550 pounds doing four hours worth of work a month. And that wow. is running around trying to get more of those. Because here's the other thing, right, which we don't talk about, which is great for professional speakers. If I'm doing an event and I need to, to get someone to speak about event industry news or event tech, I'm going to ask you to be there. Sure. Now, you've got to check your schedule and your schedule's not available. Well, that's it. I'm, I'm, I can't do it. You know, I would use the B word, bug it. Um, but here's the thing about a podcast. I could just hire another host. You could send your information across. 
and they could still convey in a very great way of, you know, great communicative way, everything you need to say and still sell you while you not being in the room. And no one cares. No one's going, but that's not Adam. He's, he's just talking about Adam. He's just mentioning Adam's articles or Adam's stuff. No, no one cares. They just want two things, information and entertainment. That's yeah. the pillars of podcasting. I just, it was recently a uh, double spread in um, the voiceover magazine, which is called The Buzz. And I was shocked how many voiceover artists had never thought of getting into podcasting. Really? Like it's such That's an me. obvious thing. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so that was a, a big, we got one of them, a, a wonderful Rachel, who's doing incredibly well with virtual events, her podcast, because she's constantly sharing. But she will share a snippet Say, if you want more of this, yep. reach out to me, which is another obvious way to get paid through podcasting is this kind of freemium to premium model. And, and just on that, one of the things that I've seen from another podcast, um, which is a great model, is the owner of that podcast, um, the, the sponsorship is, is for him and his company in, in this instance, but this could work if you had sold this concept to another company. What he, he actually does is he has a regular rotation of podcast hosts, which come in together on certain podcasts to make up a larger, you know, mind share. Mm-hmm. Um, definitely take um, his place when he can't physically be there himself. So when he's on the road, traveling, doing events, etc., he has other individuals jump in. And, and he takes a lion's share of that revenue um, against that, that podcast, but then pays those other podcast hosts to, to participate as, as freelancers. So he gets variety, coverage, cover for when he's too busy, that kind of stuff. And I can see actually, uh, maybe this is an idea for you if you've not already done it, mate, the, 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 the podcast speaker agency, right? It's, it's, a, it's the Jimmy Fallon. Here's Jimmy Fallon. He's five grand an episode. Um, we'll manage him for you. We'll work with you as the the professional thing. And then you also sell Jimmy to three other companies and, and take a commission off of Jimmy. Uh, yeah. You maybe have a, a, a collaboration of people that you're selling as a, you know, that, that um, sports center live kind of setup. It's the same three faces you see every morning. And, yeah. and that's the, that's the product. But as those individuals may be committed to other things, you still have that continuity of podcast. You still have that continuity of of delivery of content and you have variety which is one of the other things i think is really important is is different people engaging with your with your potential speakers and stuff like that so anybody listening to this if you are thinking we don't want to host a podcast we don't want to necessarily do it ourselves i think there's lots of opportunities to launch a podcast aligned with your brand and aligned with your attend uh, audience but just get those professionals in to to help deliver that content for you and, and actually be the ones that um do the hosting, do the management of it, set the speakers up, all that kind of stuff. I think, I think there's still huge value in there. And what, five hundred and fifty pound a month for sponsorship to, to reach a, on, you know, a, a, there's no limit to the audience that you could you yeah. could tap into through a podcast, right? So the, the sky's the limit, really. It's, it's it's peanuts when you think about it. The, the, we've actually done that. Interestingly enough, we have a, a membership company who. Um, has a show and they have different hosts do the show, but they're the intro voice and the outro voice, right? So that you immediately know who you're listening to. There's the voice. And then comes in this guest host. And, and what he's done very cleverly, and I, I won't give him a shameless plug, but each host that he brings in is an expert in the field of which they're doing the Q&A, yeah. which is great. So you've got this you know, Olympic storyteller having an interview with someone who does storytells, uh, sorry, storytelling conventions and they're having this great interview, which in fairness to him, he could never have done as well because he mm. hasn't got that intrinsic knowledge. He's not an expert in that field. And it's, it's exciting. He's got a great show and it's really exciting because every week it's something different. But he starts it. It's his voice of God that comes on and goes, welcome to the da show where we bring you. Da-da. And it's great. And that brings us to another monetary scheme. You can franchise. I have franchised one of my shows because you've really got a built-in audience base. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to host it anymore. No one cares if I'm the host of that particular show. What they care about is the message that's going out. So you can rent out your hosting. You can rent out your guesting. You can rent out the, the all sort of intrinsics. Much like if IBM suddenly said, hey, do you want to take over the magazine for IBTM? As long as we get in that magazine as we enter the building, we don't really care what's on the front of it. And maybe that gives us an opportunity. Well, few people are franchising their podcast, which is ridiculous because they've got this audience base that honestly just wants the same thing they've always been given. Yep. Format, function, and message. 
And I think that brings on to another example of where I think you could really add huge amounts of value and, and, and diversify in your monetization strategy, even with your current audience, which is to do similar to what Event Entry News really does, which is we cover the whole markets. So we cover festivals, concerts, tours, exhibitions, mm-hmm. brand events, ex- experiences, etc. We at the moment have just one podcast, Event Industry News, and it covers the whole subject matter. But taking a leaf out of an organization called The Morning Brew, The Morning Brew have a number of different newsletters aimed at the general same audience, but depending on what kind of communication and niche. So you get a very tailored, maybe it's just financial, or maybe it's just tech, or maybe it's just this. So within anybody listening to this, within your own industry, think about the customers that you sell into individually. And that's a potential podcast for each of one of those Correct. to the same audience. And then there's cross promotion, there's cross sponsorship, there's, there's leveraging of audience and all that kind of stuff. So I think there's, there's, there's so much opportunity around podcasts with such little barrier to entry. I just don't understand why more people don't do it. The, the one, one of the things that I have heard, and I don't know whether you've heard the same, Jason, is people are reluctant to enter podcasting because they think it's saturated. Mm, I've got, I hear it every single day. It's my favorite thing to be asked is people ask me, do you think it's a saturated market? And I've got two answers depending on my audience base. Mm-hmm. First, I say, oh, that's interesting. Do you, do you have a website? And they, yeah. And I go, oh, 1.7 billion websites on the internet as of this month, beginning of April. Yeah. If you're listening to this different time of April. In April 2020, there were 1.7 billion websites. No one is going, I shouldn't start a website. It's saturated market. Then I might say, oh, have you ever done a YouTube video? And they'll go, oh, yeah, of course. 500 million YouTube videos. Only 850,000 podcasts. Just statistically, <laughs> you have a better shot at a podcast. And here's the best thing. If you do a YouTube channel, if I come on and do a YouTube channel, I am literally starting with zero, right? Yeah. If, I, if I launch a, a website, I'm starting with zero. I've got to go out and get people to come look at my site. So those two are a nightmare. I start a podcast and I get you and you tweet out like you did today or you Instagram. I immediately get your fans, your followers, your, your friends, your family who want to hear from you. This is called a podcast Ponzi scheme, but it works <laughs> every time. You just scrape, you scrape some of their people yeah. who stay behind and go, oh, I like Jace. I listen to another episode. Oh, I like that content. I listen to another episode. People don't realize that. And you have something unique. You have an idea. You have a voice. You have maybe an avatar. You know, that hasn't been attached. And I say avatar, I mean the perfect ideal listener. Yeah. What you do is very difficult because you have a range of subjects that you are putting out there, but all of this one umbrella. The truth is in podcasting, much like most sort of niche businesses, niches to riches, as the Americans say. If you could tighten that avatar just to Star Trek fans of, of the first Star Trek film only, it's a lot easier to talk to them. It's a lot easier to sell to them because you speak the same language. You bring up the same reference points. There's these commonalities. Um, and then it's really, really easy to profitize versus doing what you do, which is a very broad thing. And hoping that someone like me who's only in events also cares about the meet area, which I, you know, or the conference side or the yeah. expo side. Yeah. So, you know, it's nice to think about when you're setting up, but no, it's, it's far from saturated. You've got an incredible opportunity. Your voice really doesn't sound like everyone else's. Your message won't be the same. Um, and there's so many ways to do it. There's, there's on our very first uh, lesson of uh, Podcast Made Perfect, which is the co- first course I ever put out. We did a thing where I suddenly become in your head and we got like an echo frame. So I go from the one ear to the other ear and then mm-hmm. it kind of echoes across. Well, that's, that's a three quid you know, piece of tech that does that. So try and do that on a YouTube video where you've got all these extra things happening. And the show takes me maybe 30 minutes to edit. For, you know, so it, this, it's really it's so much easier. It's so quicker to adopt. There's such an opportunity with a smaller scale than everything else. But like you said, it's important to remember why you're doing it, who you did it for, who's that audience member, what your monitor streams are. So it's easy to look at the ROI of how much effort you're putting into it. And then you just need a couple of things, a computer, a phone, some sort of podcasting software, you know, GarageBand, Audacity, depending if you've got a bit of spend. Zoom or Skype. Skype is free. I use Skype and yep. Ecamm. The whole thing cost me 50 bucks. And my equipment, my first equipment cost less than 100 bucks. Yeah, exactly. The, the cost of it is, is, is not high at all. And let's just talk about distribution a little bit as well, because not only can you upload to the podcast network, um, if you capture video like we are here today, 
you can upload that to YouTube. You can use the second biggest search engine in the world Correct. to leverage your audience, tag it up, keyword it up, get people to subscribe to you there. That, t- that actually takes care of all the notification for your audience and recommendation for your, your future audience right there for you. you. You don't even have to do anything other than upload it, literally like an hour's worth of, well, not even work. It's just like click a button and wait for it to upload, right? And yeah. then you've got other networks like Vimeo and oh, there's, there's just so many, I'm not going to go through and mention them. Then there's the social networks where you already have an audience, you know, yes, Twitter, LinkedIn, they limit, you know, to certain amounts of time of, of clip video, especially I think LinkedIn's like 10 minutes, yeah. 40 minute podcast, divide it up into four, four posts, link Correct. them all together. Episode one, part one, part two, part three, part four. And if you're very good, at, and you get very good at programming and you can actually program four parts of a podcast and they stand alone on their own as that mm-hmm. own short 10 minutes, then you've essentially created four podcasts, not one, right? Yeah. And, and the network effect of being able to upload audio and video to all of these other platforms and gain eyeballs and listeners and engagement is just, and it doesn't cost anything. Really, really, really in the, in the grand scheme of things. We have a strategy. We show them how from one podcast event you can create 190 days worth of social media content. And people, that's impossible. We send them the, the ebook. We charge for the ebook, but if they join the course, we give it them for free. Um, but they go, this is insane. Like we didn't even realize you could do, you know, audiograms, transcription, blogs, SEO, multiple clips, interview style, YouTube video. And we just run through it and we show them mm. the exact systems. And every time it's this kind of, whoa. And especially now, right, when it's so hard to make content, you can't be in your Lamborghini driving up and down in your bikini. It's not getting as much attention because <laughs> you're stuck in your house, isolated. Well, guess what? In a podcast, 20% is me talking to you. 80% is people imagining if I'm wearing pants. So all these things come into, it's like reading a book. You're filling in so much information and you can utilize that through social media, through all these other things, SEO, back to your brand backlinks back to your website you know again podcast 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 and for very little little attention little time and little effort to make a little ripple don't don't get me wrong obviously the effort you put in the better action you have the better quality of intro yeah. music outro music understanding format all these things will make gigantic differences but you can just jump in and kind of work it out and you'll probably trade for a while yeah i mean um in the interest of everybody listening and I do speak at events, so I will, I will give that caveat to it. Um, so I have that experience of engaging with people, holding the conversation, holding the conversation with people that aren't talking back to me. So I have that experience. But actually, before a couple of episodes to this, we had another podcast host who's with, he's still with us. He's, he's not gone anywhere. He's just, he's just <laughs> taking some time off. And, you know, it's, for me, this is no different to what I would think of as just one another one of those catch-up calls that I have with somebody that lasts an hour, right? It just yeah. naturally flows. We know the subject matter. We know the topic. We're just capturing that conversation and putting it out there for other people to, to listen to. I've, I've always said, and I still want to do this. Maybe you can help me with it, Jason. I want to do a yeah. podcast in a pub and have it kind of like as a rotating conversation. And, and, and as the night goes on and people loosen up a bit with maybe a few more drinks, maybe the conversation gets interesting. But that's you know, without the podcast bit, that's essentially the way that I view that I'm capturing this content. And just, it's those really interesting conversations I have with really interesting people that I think, oh, I just wish I, I, just wish I could relay that to, yeah. to everybody else in the way that it was, it was done in that moment in time. And podcast is perfect for that. It, it captures that moment. And it's just, it should just be a natural conversation between two people or more. There's, there's two sides to it, right? My very first episode, episode one, season one, the Guestless Podcast. Now, the Guestless Podcast now is in its sixth season. We've got over 100 mm-hmm. episodes. But the very first episode is me in a cafe, face shop, with the background noises, the whole thing. I mean, it's terrible. Um, but she's ordering coffee, I think, in the middle of my interview. But I wanted it to be kind of like The Office. I wanted it to be a mockumentary with me as this fumbling host running around trying to get into work. And it did work. It, it did very well for its time. It was very clever for its time. There wasn't many mockumentary podcasts out there. But on the opposite side, you know, you can also be polished. We have a, a someone, actually a mutual friend of ours who did a podcast, which was only 27 minutes long, 
but it took us two hours to find every time this person, I'm not going to say male or female, said, <laughs> like, uh, like, da da da, like, da da da, like, and, and, I, and then went, oh my God, I hate it. Why does it sound like that? And we said, hold on, give it back to us. Let us do another edit, send it back to you. Check out all the likes. There were some ums, some ahs, some ands. In fact, there were 147 ands in a 27 minute podcast. Um, and then gave it back. It was a bit shorter. It was only like 18 minutes, but it was beautiful. He sounded, he, damn it, um, the person sounded so polished and went, wow. Now, again, if there was a live virtual event and you made all those mistakes, you might yeah. hang your head in shame afterwards, but you can clear up all of that. You can make it as natural as this or incredibly polished with great sound effects and take out the barking dog and the hooting car and the baby crying in the background oh the amazon delivery driver with the wife oh, just picking up the uh <laughs> the parcel as you've probably heard twice now um, yes. on this as as we all are working from home and doing our best in the situation but but yeah that that that's an interesting point because it can be as as long as the content's engaging it can be as i like to call it as rough and ready as as this with background noises you know we don't generally have many other conversation ever in our life where it's perfectly quiet right mm-hmm. Um, you Absolutely. know, we, even on the phone, there's background noises, there's dogs, there's passing traffic, all that kind of stuff. If I remember rightly, didn't you also do an episode on the plane? 33,000 feet. There <laughs> you go. <laughs> <laughs> so don't, don't be, don't be afraid of, um, I, I very much was in, in the, in, when I started out this, like I need it to be perfectly quiet because any, any kind of other noise in, in the round is going to be so distracting. And it, it, it probably is a slightly polarizing thing when it's not expected on the podcast when somebody's listening, but it's not a reason for people to switch off because it's for an instant, right? It's just, it's just there and then. If you want to get to that level, which we've done, which we've set up studios for certain podcasts, we did one with you and Kevin Jackson and a few other people back in the early days. And, and, and that is when you can control that and, and put that time and effort into it, it is better. Mm. but it's kind of like the Casey Neistat thing right the biggest question he gets is what equipment do you use Mm. what equipment do you use what camera do you use and people rush out and and buy that camera and he stopped giving that advice on what he uses equipment wise and the only advice he gave back is just start Mm. it doesn't matter he he was like when I first started it was it wasn't even iPhone quality cameras it was shitty camcorders it was anything I could get my hands on. I think he sold a film or series to CNBC or one of the American networks, if I've, I might have just modeled that up, but he sold that to them based on like the, the VHS recorder, the home cam kind of style things. Yeah. And it's, it's, it's again, it, it comes back to podcasting. It's about the content, right? It's about, Absolutely. it's about the content and then you can build upon the production level over and up of that and reinvest and, and make the audio better. We, we actually advise our guests. Um, I caught Jason out on this one, um, but we advise our guests, you know, for the small investment that you would make for you to buy a cheap podcasting mic off Amazon, it makes this conversation so much better between us. So it's, it's, it's also somewhat reliant on the, um, on the person coming on the podcast as, as well. So here's a, here's a hack for that. Um, and we, it's funny because I was going to send this to you for notes after this podcast. We, we train, obviously, all the prospects of podcasting. One of them is the legality and equipment. So before an email, before this happens, between you and I or any of your guests, we send an email that says, by the way, two things you need to understand. One, audio quality is incredibly important. If you don't at least have a Logitech 350 headset, which costs 47 quid, and here's the link, click here, which, by the way, you click through my uh, Amazon affiliate link, so I make money out of it. So <laughs> another way to monetize a podcast. Um, but, it, you know, then we will send you one. We'll, we'll send you one. You can send it back to us because uh, it's only costing us 30 bucks, and we know that you'll have good audio quality. And what it does, a little caveat, if you don't like the interview, you can send an email after. So I'm really sorry. Your headset didn't work. It didn't sound so great on my side. So I had to cancel and cut you and they don't mind and you're fine to go as opposed to actually you were terrible and I don't want to do that to my guests. The (laughs) second thing is we send a little thing that says, by the way, we own this medium because I could have this great interview with you and three hours from now, my publicist says, Jason, I don't want you talking badly about online events. You've just got this huge virtual adventure hosting and you just bad mouth that saying podcasting is better. I can call you up and legally remove this entire show. But if you've just sent an email that said, welcome, and here's the equipment you need. And in small letters at the bottom said, by the way, all media that is recorded with us is owned by Adam Perry Productions. There's nothing I can do. And what I wanted to say is- That's a a really good point. And I will send you an example of the exact legal terminology you can use. 
Um, but the Audica mic, for example, is Audica, I think it's the AR210. Uh, yeah, Audio Technica AR, ATR2100 has sold out for the first time in the history of Amazon UK and US. Wow. Because so many people realize it's 45 bucks and you sound like a professional speaker mm -hmm. through a podcast. The reason I haven't linked it up is I've just bought the Rodecaster Pro, which is an entire studio, and uh, I haven't figured it out yet. I'm all the See, damn no idea. That's the route that you go down when you when you do start getting into things. You then justify huge expenses on bettering your equipment, and why and yes. why not? Um, we we actually do generally, and uh, Jason, I didn't do this for you, but we do generally send uh, podcast instructions with everything Excellent. outlined on that. Interestingly, we don't, own, I, I, just so you know, Jason, I own all this media. Um, after this podcast. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's, it's a really good point about covering yourself and, and those kind of inf that kind of information and tips. I think it just, it just clarifies to everybody what the expectations are from the outset, right? What is expected? If you don't ask somebody, oh, by the way, would you mind getting a better mic? They're not going to get a better mic. No. Um, it, it's as simple as, as just laying it out of what your expectations are. Another great piece of advice for me is um, and we're building this for, for event engineers at the moment is have just a quick survey for your host that says tell me some interesting stuff about you how do you want to be interested you know what's the childhood story what what your dreams and aspirations be and that can be fed into the podcast to make it just so much more than, than about that topic you get much more insight into into the actual person themselves we we did a study of the top uh 50 uh, seven and eight figure podcasters and they could either they were worth that much through their podcast or their download numbers were in the millions and hundred millions. And there was an actual script. We noticed that this exact, there was an actual eight step formula that they got almost every single guest to do. They just had different ways of doing it, but it always started with an origin story. You know, tell me about how you got here. And then this epiphany bridge, then what happened? What was the aha moment? Then tell me the extrinsic thing that occurred, then the intrinsic thing that happened, and then success came. But then guess what? There was conflict. And all this is, those writers out there will know, it's the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. It's the thing that connects us to a, a write, an audience, an author, a hero on a story page. A, and you can do the same thing with brands. You're winning. You're absolutely winning. And, um, and we use it all the time. It's one of, I think, two or three scripts that we send out to all our clients to say, look, this, this works no matter who you're interviewing. And it's so simple. You know, have a good headphone, ask these certain questions, do it in a certain way, make sure there's a beginning, a middle, and an end. Have a call to action at the end. And also work out what success looks like. The biggest thing right now in podcasting is something called pod fade, which means the average podcast has only got three episodes something happens in one and three where they go now nah, it didn't work out because they didn't work out what success looked like for the show do you think that is we, we live in a world of instant gratification right um do you think that's the case of well i've only had a few people listen to my first one i've had a few people listen to my second one maybe a few more um i'm also really struggling to find the time to think about interesting guests and blah 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 do you do you think that because because I tell this story about Event Intro News, right? Event Intro News now reaches an international audience. We reach everybody, we reach people in every part of the, the corner of the globe. Um, we have gone from, from zero, literally the first person to ever subscribe or follow our social media channels was, was myself, right? I was number <laughs> one on Twitter. Twitter, we've now over 50,000. We have a group on LinkedIn, over 100,000. Our, our page on EIN has, um, just on LinkedIn, has over 38,000 followers. Um, you know, we, we gain millions and billions and millions of page impressions every year through digital media and event news. But that's a, that's a decade's worth of work, mm. right? And we didn't even launch a podcast until a few years ago. So, yeah. you know, we, we kind of focused on all of that other stuff first. And then we had an audience which we could deliver a podcast through. So, so our podcast has grown quite quickly. I think 60,000 listeners uh, over the cool. last year or something like that. But I think, I don't, again, I don't know whether you agree to this, but I think it's just people expect too much too quickly. They do. And also they don't do the work up front. It's like people who start mm. businesses and they don't know what to do with it after a while. You know, a, a business and a podcast is almost the opposite of marriage. In marriage, you do all the work in the beginning, you know, because you're thinking, oh, well, I get it, I've got it, I'm good. <laughs> but in a business and a podcast, you should really think about the end. What does the end look like? Yeah. Do you sell the business? Do you sell the podcast? 
Do you hand it over to a younger generation? Is there a, a new opportunity? Do you, mm-hmm. do you franchise it? Do you, you know, all these different things. Really think about that. And then think of what success looks like. We've got a gentleman, a common friend of ours, Caleb Parker. We did a, the Work Bold podcast for him. We built him a podcast. We asked him right in the front, what does success look like? Is it lots of listeners? Is it lots of engagement? Is it yeah. lots of subscribers? And he said, no, I just want to, I want to be seen as an expert leader. And if I interview other experts, immediately that'll happen. So guess what we paid attention to every time we put out one of his shows? Yep. What were the other people putting him on? What lists was he suddenly added on? All of a sudden, he's in the top 100 people in prop tech, et cetera, et cetera. Well, great. Wow. Then it's success. No matter what happens to the show now, congratulations, you've done your job. Um, and now we're doing season two with him. We're saying, well, what's the next thing? Is it you know, more opportunity to travel? More, is it money? Is it monetary? Is it more listeners? Is it a higher ranking on the iTunes charts? Like let's, yep. Right at the beginning, choose one. Choose one KPI. That is success. Don't go, I also want fans. I also want to be mentioned. I also want to be on other shows. I also want one. Choose one business model, one engagement metric, one metric yeah. of success, and you'll yeah. be fine. I think that's so I think that's so important. The that the reason to launch something like a podcast does not necessarily have to mean dollars and pounds in the bank account right there and then, right? It could be like Caleb's done, which is is you know, he's he's raised himself up. He's, he's increased his, the awareness of him. He's positioned himself as a thought leader. I Absolutely. mean, Caleb was already really good at that kind of stuff anyway, but clearly the investment from him in his marketing budget in, in you know, working with you to make him a good podcast host, launching that podcast, the podcast equipment, the time spent in obviously bringing in thought leaders and things like that that's going to help, uh, you know, elevate him as well has, has done exactly that. Without another dollar coming back into him, it probably has retrospectively or, or on he the has done very well funny enough yeah, yeah we talked about exactly that. Yes. In, in the transfer uh, uh, you know caleb recently sold his company didn't they to, to another company yes i'm sure the, the podcast had partly to do with that i know it's a brand that they've continued to to, to to invest in going forward and stuff as well so there are so many reasons to do a podcast um jason to to to, to wrap up i can imagine me being sat on the other end of this listening and going i want to launch I need somebody to, to, to teach me like a, somebody would have a professional, somebody teach them how to speak or be a TV host or anything like that. Let's just recap on where people can engage with you, with your, with your courses, with your guides, your eBooks, all that kind of content that they can get hold of and, and help teach themselves. Where can they get that? www.apodcastmasterclass.com. It's got all the information there. It'll say sold out, but there's an email. You can email me. There's actually a link to my calendar. My VA will book you in for 15 minute consultation. And let's just see if it's right for you and your brand. I'm 100% transparent, I'm 100% honest. I'll tell you if I think it you know, doesn't fit your metric, but I'll always ask you first, what does success look like? So have that prepared. Don't come in and go, I don't know what I wanna do with my podcast. I just want a podcast. Um, Cause I'll tell you right off the bat, don't bother. There's so many better things to spend your time and money on. So <laughs> please feel free to reach out to me. I'm very easy to find. You just Google Jason Allen Scott, spell Allen right, A-L-L-A-N and you'll definitely find me. And a recap of your own podcast where people can listen about those individual topics. If you're a wannapreneur, entrepreneur, someone looking for a side hustle, the guestless podcast is our number one show. Um, if you're in events and you're looking to be smarter, you want to hear from people like Adam and things like that, then smarter event planning. If you're in the crypto space, then of course, not another crypto show. And if you're a parent currently going through this pandemic, definitely check out Treasure Time podcast. Amazing. And we will link to all of these in the show notes so people can, can go to those. We'll also throw Jason's affiliate link in there to the uh, <laughs> podcast mic. And um, yeah, even though it's sold out, I'm sure, I'm sure that'll track through somewhere or other options will present themselves or the ones are available and that kind of stuff. Jason, I, I mean, this is one of those situations where I'm sure we could, we could totally go off on tangents and do a whole Joe Rogan episode. <laughs> I, I'd like to thank you personally for giving me the time uh, at such short notice to come on and, and speak to me about this. I hope those listening or watching have found this, that found this useful. If they have, if you have, please let Jason and myself know on social media, um, follow us, like, share, all that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, we'll speak to you soon, Jason. Thank you very much, big guy. Take care of you. 